Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swamini Namine Namaste Sarasati Devi Goravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shanyavadi Paschacha Deshatarine Vanchakaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patita nam pavane bio vaishna vibio namo namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Atvaita Gadadhar Shri Vasati Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare. So very glad to see all of you here this evening. Thank you for your association. Thank you for giving me a chance to present some of the teachings from Srimad Bhagavatam to you in relation to this course on Bhakti Vai Bhav, right? So you're on the third canto. And we're beginning from chapter number 13, which is dealing with the appearance of Lord Varaha. I hope you've been finding the course enlightening. Uh, I'll share the screen with you. We have a PowerPoint. Are you able to see it all? Are you, can I hear from you? Are, are you seeing it okay? Prabhu, I'm not hearing anything. Oh. <laughs> Connection's down. Okay. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Oh, Recording in progress. Nice to be back with you all. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, you know, I'm in Mars. The internet connection is not the best. This is something you have to tolerate. And there are a lot of people. Uh, sorry to interrupt you Maharaj. Uh, Ramaya Prabhu has also joined. Oh, welcome Ramaya Prabhu. Ramanya Prabhu. Hare Krishna Prabhu, my, I'm happy to have your association. For the, on this, and I wanted. Are you able to see it? Okay. Good. So you. All right. Sorry. Okay. They they changed. You know, over the years things change. Unit 9 became unit, it's still, it's still lesson 1. The previous unit, anybody remembers what happened in the previous unit? You were hearing about? Lord Brahma and Kumaras has appeared. The Kumaras, anybody else appeared? Beside the four Kumaras, who else appeared? Uh, Lord, Shiva. Lord Shiva. Okay. <laughs> Wow, you couldn't understand anything. Anyway, Manu, Manu, where did they come from? From from Lord Brahma, from the body of Brahma. Yes, from the body. they. 
took up the duty to help them. Very unstable tonight. They took up the duty to help their father in, propagate, pro, uh, in filling up the universe with the living entities. Two famous sons, Priyavrata and Uttanapad. Uttanapad you hear about in the fourth canto and Priyavrata comes in the fifth canto. And then three daughters, Akuti, Devahuti and Prachut, Prashuti. Devahuti, of course, coming at the end of the third canto in Kapila Shiksha. What's, that, what's wrong? Something to some point? Anybody wants to make a point there? I was hearing some voices. Okay, so this is the, the family of Manu and Satarupa. Nice family. Three daughters and two sons. A nice, happy family. Okay, then a, a look at what we're going to be covering in this unit. Again, you see it's not unit 9, it's unit 11. I'll have to change that. Uh, we'll hear about the appearance of Lord Varaha this evening. All right, so the first section will describe Lord Brahma and his instructions to Swayambhuva Manu and his wife, how he wants their assistance to fill up the universe. And then we will hear the problem which Manu has and he turns to Lord Brahma for help and asks Lord Brahma if he can lift the universe from the bottom of the ocean. And then the next section, text 18 to 25, while Brahma was contemplating a solution, a small boar, the size of the upper portion of a thumb, came out of his nostril. The boar then became situated in the sky in a wonderful manifestation as gigantic as a great elephant. So you can see the very nice illustration prepared for us by the Bhaktivedanta Book Trust artists. I was looking over the letters which uh, Pr Prabhupada wrote to devotees and there's one letter there where Prabhupada is responding to a question by the artist. The artist was saying to Prabhupada that Boars are not very beautiful. So how am I supposed to paint the picture of Lord Varaha? Because I understand the Lord is always attractive. And Prabhupada replied to the artist telling them that, yes, you're right, that the Lord is always attractive, even when he comes as a boar. So he said, do your best and try to make him look as attractive as possible. So I think in this illustration, they certainly did a good job. Lord Varaha doesn't look too disgusting there. <laughs> and the comparison is made to an elephant. Just like a great elephant manifesting. Okay, then the next section of this chapter. After, after roaring, Lord Varaha at, enters into the Garbhadak ocean. Lord Varaha searched after the earth by smell. The Lord found the earth on the bottom of the Garbhadak ocean, where the planets rest during the devastation at the end of Brahma's day. Lord Varaha took the earth on his tusks, and got it out of the water. And then, next section, we'll hear the prayers offered by the residents in the higher planets, the 
Satyaloka, Janaloka, Tapaloka, and they're offering Vedic hymns to glorify the appearance of the Lord. And finally, Varaha kills Haranyaksha and suspends the earth on the edge of his white tusks. Varaha then placed the earth on the surface of the water and entered to his own abode. All right, so that's the ninth chapter, uh, rather the thirteenth chapter. I have to get that nine out of there. It's the third, we're doing chapter thirteen. So I want you to understand that it's mentioned by the Acharyas that there are actually two Varahas. One is described here, white coloured, Sweta Varaha. And that's, that appears during the time of Swayambhuvamanu. And during the time of Swayambhuvamanu, at that time the earth had fallen into the bottom of the Garbhodak ocean. So it's the Sweta Varaha who picks up the earth from the bottom of the Garbhodak ocean. But then there's a, another Varaha, who's the red colored Varaha, and he appears during the Chakshusha Manu. Right? So there's quite a time gap there between the two incarnations. And the red Varaha, he's the one who actually kills Haranyaksha. So this is uh, brought to your attention. The, the Acharyas explain that uh, Vyasa, Srila Vyasa Dev amalgamated or brought the two incarnations together into one for the sake of convenience for writing Srimad Bhagavatam. We, we could also talk about just why would the earth fall into the bottom of the Garbhodak ocean? That is something which we should also be prepared to explain. How is it possible that the earth could fall into the bottom of the Garbhodak ocean? Anyone would like to offer an explanation in this regard? Prabhupada said, as far as I remember or wrote that, um, Yadan Yaksha drilled into the earth and so it lost its spin or its balance and it fell. But at the same time, I have a question also in this regard that sometimes it's said or even depicted that it was actually Pumandala which fell into the Garbhodaka ocean. Uh -huh. Oh, yes, that's another point that sometimes it's said that it's Bomondala which actually fell into the bottom of the Garbhodaka ocean. But what, uh, what are some of the reasons why it could fall into the... You said Haranyaksha drilled into the earth. What was he doing? Yeah, he, yeah, he took out uh, oil and maybe also gold. Right, Haranyaksha, yeah, he's looking for gold. And yeah, not oil, well, yeah. <laughs> and Probably, but I think he made the comparison that nowadays we take the oil but it's always the endeavor of the demons to uh, plunder the earth and in that sense also destroy nature and even to that extent that it can fall out of its orbit. Right, yes. The, the modern uh, times we're drilling the earth trying to take the oil out and it could have similar effects to Haranyaksha. What happened to Haranyaksha during what was it, Satya Yuga or Satya Yuga or Treta Yuga, when Haranyaksha appears in the Satya Yuga, is it? I think so. Anyway, the earth fell into the bottom of the Garbhodak ocean because Haranyaksha is digging everywhere for gold and it created the instability in the planet. So we're warned if we continue drilling taking out the oil, it's going to upset the sense of gravity which is there within the earth and the earth could again fall into the bottom of the, uni bottom of the universe. It's something which we sh need to think about. Alright, so 
the instability of the earth is certainly mentioned there and we're warned. We should take only what we need from the earth. Everything is provided according to what we need. Don't take more than what we need. And so similarly with petrol and so on like that, we shouldn't be extravagant with these things. Okay, going ahead, here we see chapter 14, Pregnancy of Diti in the Evening. Vidura asked Maitreya, what was the reason for the fight between the demon king and Lord Bor? Maitreya narrates how Diti begged her husband Kashyap to have intercourse with her in the evening. Kashyapa requests Diti to wait because the time was inauspicious. Kashyapa explained that everything was inauspicious and thus she would have two contemptuous sons who, will, who kill poor faultless living entities, torture women. Then the Lord will descend and kill them. Chapter 15, Description of the Kingdom of God. This is a very interesting chapter because generally we don't find information about the Kingdom of God in any kind of scripture. If you, if you ask uh, the Catholics or the, the Muslims, what's it like in the Kingdom of God? Even the Buddhists have a, a difficult time to tell you about nirvana. So we have very good descriptions of the kingdom of God described here in the third canto. So that's chapter 15. The influence of the suns in the womb of Diti expanded darkness throughout the universe. The demigods approached Brahma for an explanation. Brahma explains how his sons, the four Kumaras, were stopped from entering into Vaikuntha by the two doorkeepers, Jai and Vijay. The Kumars thought the two doorkeepers should be sent to the material world because they found duality in Vaikuntha. Padmanabha then arrived and displayed his beautiful form. When the breeze carrying the aroma of Tulsi leaves from the toes of the lotus feet of the Lord entered the nostrils of those sages, they experienced a change from impersonal to personal understanding. So this is a really nice section of Srimad Bhagavatam actually. It's not highly philosophical. You get a lot of nice descriptions, nice pastimes. Interesting. All right, so coming back to chapter 13. So these are some questions which are there in your, uh, in the closed book ex ex exercises things which you have to do. Explain the significance of Lord Varaha's appearing from the nostril of Brahma and in the form of a boar. Not a very challenging question. Would someone like to re respond to this? What about from the, why does, why does he come from the nostril of Brahma? Have you all had a chance to look over these questions? Anyway, you can look at text number 20. Uh, can I answer? Yes, please, Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, I have heard that uh, uh, the Lord is personification of Vedas and Lord Brahma is uh, born from the Lotus and because Lord Brahma is always uh, breathing the uh, Vedas, that is why uh, Lord Varaha appears from his nostrils 
Lord Vera also represents the, he also is the personification of the Vedas. Okay, very nice, yes. The personification of the Vedas. <laughs> All right, and, and then what is the significance of his coming in the form of a boar? Someone else like to answer this one? We like boars, huh? Would you like boars? It's, interest, it's interesting, actually, the two incarnations, Narsimha and Varaha, are both very popular in worship in South India. People are very fond of worshipping Lord Varaha and Lord Narsimha. The worship of Lord Varaha used to be very popular and there was even a, there was a kingdom in South India where their currency was varahas. They didn't have rupees, they had varahas. So the Lord in the form of varaha is very popular. <laughs> in ISKCON, the worship of Lord Varaha hasn't really taken on yet. But here in Mayapur, in Navadvip Dam, we do see there is one temple, there is a on Godiamat, where they have a Lord Varaha deity, over there in Navadweep, it, because it said that Lord Varaha appeared over there, and it said that's called Kola Dweep over there, and there's a, they, they installed the deity of Lord Varaha. It said Lord Varaha appeared in Navadweep in the Satya Yuga, in, the, in response to the prayers of a devoted Brahmana. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Prabhu. Dhanad Pranam Maharaj. Maharaj, may I attempt the question uh, you asked uh, why it says uh, Baraha in the form of a boar? Yes. Um, Maharaj, as I understand that uh, the subtle form of uh, yark is smell. So, the uh, Baraha, the boar, they are very... Uh, Export, they can uh, identify the smell by the smelling power. So yeah. this is the reason uh, the boar form is the best one, which can drive into the uh, the mud where the earth is there, and by the smelling smelling power, you can identify where is the earth. Right. Yes. Exactly. Very good, Prabhu. Thank you very much. Very nice explanation. Uh, the power of the boar, that they can locate things in the mud. So the bottom of the universe, <laughs> it's, you know, everything goes to the bottom, everything goes down, so the bottom of the lake, there's always dirty. We see here in, in the holy dams, they have a number of coons and lakes, and they often have to empty out the water and clean the bottom of the lake. You know, like every, well, I don't know how many years they do it. It depends, of course, on their economic ability, how often they can do it. Sometimes they get donors who come along and donate for that. They did it for Radhakund a few years ago. They emptied out the water of Radhakund and cleaned out the bottom of the Radhakund. And the, at the bottom, of course, so much, so many things go down. So similarly in the universe, at the bottom of the universe is dirty, muddy, a lot of things there in the bottom of the universe. So the Lord took the form of the boar to go in there, bring it all up, from the, bring the earth up, and using his tusks to support the earth, on his tusk, he could bring up the earth. And so, a very wonderful form, actually. Boars, generally, we think they were disgusting creatures. We see them in Vrindavan, particularly in Vrindavan. They have, you will see, we see the, the wild pigs or the boars. And sometimes they, they will get the boars they, and they, they have to shave them. They have to shave all their skin off them because they're so dirty. 
because they're always there in the dirty water and the mud and in the, all the filth. And so they can spread disease. So from time to time they have people come to just grab them, capture the boars and shave off all the hairs off their body. So <laughs> Lord Boar, however, we will hear in this chapter how Lord Boar, after he dove into the bottom of the Garbadak Ocean, and then he shook his body and the drops of water from his body, it was falling on the sages and the sages were becoming purified. The sages in the higher planets were feeling purified from the water coming from his body. Could anybody explain that? Why would it, how would it be so different that this, you know, the boar is such a dirty creature, but the water from his body is purifying the great sages. How uh, could... Maharaj. Yes, Maharaji. Uh, Maharaj, in a lecture actually I heard about, uh, about this, that Krishna also wanted to show that, um, that in uh, the most abominable creature is, uh, is the boar. But Krishna wanted to show even in uh, that form also uh, he can appear and he can uh, um, show that he is uh, the most supreme. Probably that is the reason. Okay. Yes. Yes, right. Actually, he's not really the boar. He's the supreme personality of Godhead, right? He's not the boar, he's, but he's, this is the, the Supreme Lord himself coming and taking that form for his particular pastime. So by that form of Lord Varaha, he's able to uh, bring up the earth and also at the same time he fought with Haranyaksha. And defeated him. Oh, this is later on. How Haranyaksha, who was born first, was considered younger than Haranyakashipu. So, would someone like to volunteer to explain that for everyone? How, how could it be? Srila Prabhupada explained as far as I remember that the one who comes out first is conceived the second. When they are twins, then actually it's from other way around. Yeah. The one who comes out last is actually the one kind of semen who had first merged with the oval. Yes, right. <laughs> it's surprising, isn't it? Interesting. When someone has twins uh, in China, you know, in China they, they call the, the first one Dada, meaning big, big, and the, they call the second one Xiao Xiao, meaning small, small. <laughs> so one twin is Dada, another one is Xiao Xiao. <laughs> the first one is considered the big. It's the wrong way, they got it the wrong way around. And how, would, how was the earth able to float on the water? This, in the 18th chapter, how is it possible that the earth is able to float on the water of the Garbadak Ocean? Simply by? By the power of the Lord. The Lord empowered her so she could float. Right. And how is the Lord distinguished from all the other residents of Vaikuntha? In the 19th chapter? something which you must have already studied before. The Lord is distinguished from all the other residents of Vaikuntha because of? Because of what? Kastuba. Kastuba. Yeah, Kastuba, okay, yes. One, one is Kastuba. And Srivatsa, here of Srivatsa. Yeah. Yes, right, very good. And what happened to Diti shortly before the death of her demonic son? 
That's a more difficult question. Anyway, we'll wait till we go to the 19th chapter for that one. Not so important today. Coming back to this 13th chapter here. We want to understand principles which can be drawn from Brahma's acceptance, Manu's acceptance of Brahma's order, right? The Manu was given orders by Lord Brahma. What, what did Brahma actually want from Manu? There, there were some, the general instruction was? Population, to expand the population. Okay, yes, to expand the population. And anything else? Thereby please Brahma and also the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Please Lord Brahma, please the Personality of Godhead. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And on the other hand, we have the four Kumaras, rejection of Brahma's order. So, what we want you to do, we want you to discuss in a group, we'll make some groups, and you can discuss in the group, what is the relative or the respective importance of these principles, and how these principles may be relevant for current social issues in ISKCON. We are part of ISKCON, the greater ISKCON, the family of ISKCON, and just like Manu, he's the head of the family, the universal family. So within ISKCON we have our, universe, our, we have our founder Acharya, Srila Prabhupada, and we have his family and these principles which are there. The contrast, Manu, the acceptance, and the Kumara's rejection. What are the general principles in these two cases and how, we want you to discuss, how important are these principles? for us in ISKCON? And is, are, is it relevant for us in ISKCON, these, the, these principles? Of course, Manu and Brahma, their relationship is father and son. Fathers and sons. Spiritual masters like the father, disciples like the son. We have our founder Acharya and his children, his sons, as well as his daughters. We're all the children anyway, if you don't make distinction. When the son is obedient to the father, then it's very good. Very nice, the father is very happy. But does it happen in the modern times? I don't know about you, but you know, well, I left home when I was about 17. <laughs> I didn't have a lot of uh, uh, harmony with my father. We didn't get along so well together. Muslim. <laughs> Hare Krishna, can, maybe you want to mute there before you talk. So, can we, how many people do we have here tonight in the, gr in the group, in the class? 20 is it? 18? 18. All right, so then, uh, what, will we have three groups of six? Or do you want smaller groups? We have 16 students in our class today. 16? Yes, ma'am. All right, so 16, so then, then, then it's easier. So groups of four, 
four people in each group. And we'll have four groups. So who who can make that who can make the groups for us? I'm making Maharaj. Oh very good, Prabhu. Thank you. Uh, have you assigned questions to each group, Maharaj? So do do they have to do a separate question? No, same questions. We, but but we want you to discuss particularly the relevant the relevance of these principles in relation to ISKCON. The importance of these principles and how relevant they are to ISKCON. Recording stopped. Chaitanya Vishnu Prabhu, you have to join breakout room. Alright, how much time for the discussion? Well, like seven minutes or eight minutes.
Can you make me the ho you have to make me the host that uh, sca share the screen again? Uh, I've made Maraj, you are co-host. Oh, thank you. I should join one of the groups. We are about to close, Baraj. Time is over. Oh, okay then. All right. Everybody? No, Maharaj, they are joining. Okay. Now everybody is back, Maharaj. Okay, so who's going to be spokesman for group Recording number one? Recording in progress. Group number one, who's the spokesman? Yeah, spokesman. Thank you, Krishna Maharaj. Thank you, Krishna Maharaj. Thank you, Krishna Maharaj. Um, Maharaj, so we uh, identified that, um, uh, so, here there is, it is mentioned that uh, the Brahma's uh, order was followed by Manu. So, uh, according to Varnashrama system, so that is a perfect principle that the son had to follow the order of uh, the father. So, that was followed and it is a very encourageable. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the Kumaras were rejected. But the Kumaras rejected, it is for the higher purpose. So, because uh, the first one, the Manu's acceptance, because both are coming in the lineage of the disciplic succession and uh, they are following the Supreme Lord's order. So, it is uh, encourageable and it is acceptable. Uh, and in the Kumara's rejection also, it is not wrong, even though they didn't follow the father's instruction, but it is for the higher purpose. So, when it comes for higher purpose, so it, it is acceptable that we can reject um, because if it is not going to satisfy the Supreme Lord, then we should not do. But if it's going to satisfy the Supreme Lord, then we can accept it. So that's uh, the main point we have. Okay. Yes, sounds good. Everything's reasonable. Nothing much. What about this second part then? The importance of these principles? So the principles are uh, uh, the first and uh, the lineage of uh, the line of disciplic succession. So Prabhupada mentioned. So whatever that comes in that line of disciplic succession, so we should accept that. And uh, uh, and uh, another thing is um, uh, like when we as a father, uh, the uh, parent, uh, they have to uh, give the knowledge of Krishna consciousness to their child and bring in the proper Varnashrama system. Could you explain more what you mean about what comes in the line of disciplic succession? They should accept that. Could you give some examples of what, that, what things we are obliged to accept? Um, 
the whatever the uh, spiritual knowledge that we are receiving so it has to be accepted by the uh, disciplic succession so we should not accept uh, from anyone else so it has to come starts from krishna and then brahma to manu so how it is descended so it has now for us like shri prabhupad have given and uh, after that like we have special masters after shri prabhupad so we should accept in that disciplic succession and it has to come in the proper sampradaya so if it is not come in the proper sampradaya so we should not accept that particular knowledge well knowledge of course we're going to accept that's not a very big but what about the these principles that you know on one hand you know people want to give up the the world they want to give up all material consideration for the, the, in the case of the kumars you know they just want to go away from the world they just want to you know give up every all kinds of responsibilities of the material world that's something that certainly you know in, in the world that that's kind of not very socially acceptable by most people we saw people joining the krishna consciousness movement you know we were accused of being a brainwashing cult in the beginning probably time taking people away from their homes and having them dressed in these funny clothes and the haircuts the shaved heads we were considered fanatics and we were a cult we were brandished as a cult yes ma'am so i think going into the trouble yes maharaj subject of permission yes uh, in support of the rejection by kumaras uh, to the instruction imparted by lord brahma uh, yes the uh, the wars go in conformity they were the buddha kanana pitunang naya munja raja means if someone saw the lord by rejecting the instructions of the superiors if any he is not duty bound to us besides any responsibility in regard he is he is not what means if someone serves the lord serves the lord as a responsible in deciding the the the, the topmost responsibility he is not due to want to serve anyone in the universe that goes in confirm to the boss devasi buttapta nenang pitruna oh don't don't con don't con verses in sanskrit to me you know <laughs> don't give me these th you know i consider me to be you know i'm just a an outsider you know i'm a worried father or a worried mother i'm thinking about my child who's come to your society and you know my son you know i brought him up to be a good boy and now he wants to become a monk and you're quoting me you're quoting some sanskrit words to me you know it's not going to be very meaningful to me and i'm talking we want to understand the social and uh the, the social issues which are there you know and we're talking about a a society an international society and we have centers and devotees members and my son left my left her home to go to join your society you know how long will he stay there I see people come to these cults they come there for some time and then they get tired and they go away and give it all up I don't I am just worried you know I don't think it's such a good thing I'm I'm just presenting to you some of the the issues which are going to come up and how how we have to deal with these things in ISKCON Yes Maharaj can I speak from group too Oh please do Prabhu <laughs> Thank you. Um so yeah as we know back in the 1970s uh many devotees joined at various ages so now i believe um actually i can't speak for all senders because i'm only familiar with some but um yeah like in the uk anyway at least like there's a minimum age requirement you need to be at least 18 i you need to be an adult you can't just uh join iscon just like that and i believe in other centers as well <clears throat> when you want to 
join ISKCON, say as a Brahmachari or as a Brahmacharini, it's generally advised you have some experience, i.e. working the world, and you're very clear as to why you want to join ISKCON. So there's some prerequisites um, joining ISKCON. It's not as simple as just joining for the sake of, like, as you put it, like falsely renouncing, you know? You don't want to take any responsibility, no. You have to take some responsibility. Um, so that's just one point. Yes. Thank you, Prabhu. That's, that's important. It's certainly one must... We did have a problem. There was a young girl joined the Krishna Consciousness Movement and devotees were encouraging her. And it ended up costing us a lot of money, big money, and many, many years in courts, court battles and stuff. We have to be very careful. Sometimes, you know, the devotees were thinking, oh, she's really sincere, she's really a great devotee. She's like 14 years old or something, you know, or 15 years old, and they, and they were hiding her and sending her to other temples to keep her away from her parents. And you, we have to be very careful about these things. Can you understand? Recording stopped. Can you understand the issue? Recording in progress. <laughs> Hare Krishna. You understand the issues we're discussing? Yes. What about yes. group group number three? Oh, we did not. Group number two did not say anything. <laughs> group number two. Okay, go ahead then. Say more. Adam, Adam, Adam. I'm happy to hear. Okay. Me. He was part. Uh, do, we, do you want uh, us to say from the you know the whole points? Yeah. Or yeah. Go ahead. Just. Okay, so there are uh, two things which we are discussing here about the acceptance as well as the rejection. So in the acceptance, um, the father's duty is to, you know, as you are saying that, you know, to make the kids grow up in a proper manner so they are a decent human being. Uh, and so the kid's duty, the son or the daughter's duty is to follow what father has taught and follow in their footsteps. In the disciplic succession, in the spiritual life, we have to follow, as uh, Group 1 was also saying, that we have to follow the disciplic succession, but um, the disciplic succession is like we are Brahma Sampradaya, so that way we have to follow. And uh, for, uh, for the rejection thing, uh, the Kumaras were also right in their path, because if we are doing anything for Krishna, then we do not need to follow the Varna. If, it's, if it is a pure devotional service we are doing, we do, do not even need to follow the Varna Ashram system. We have to just serve Krishna. So they are 24 hours, they are totally absorbed in Krishna consciousness. At that time, no rules and regulation is required because whatever they are doing, they are doing it for Krishna's pleasure. Uh, and that is, and it's for higher purpose. So that is the reason when Kumaras actually rejected the order of Lord Brahma, it was also right because they had a higher purpose in life. And in ISKCON, as uh, we are seeing this uh, social issues, like Siddharth Prabhu said about that point is also there. Other than that, um, we have to make them understand that this is only temporary life, this is one life and we should not, we should go beyond that because ultimately the relevance is our, how we are going to be in our next life, how we have to go back to Godhead so that we are away from these material miseries and disease and death and birth again and again. So this, this is the point which we have to emphasize so that they realize that Today we are happy, maybe temporarily, and we are thinking we are happy, but then when the problem comes, we realize, oh my God, what is going to happen? And this thing will be coming, no matter in what situation you are, no matter what social standing we have. So to come out of this, this is the only way to practice devotional service totally and you know, absorb in that, and so we can actually go back to Godhead. So we are not under this material energy and we are not taking birth and death again and again. So who is actually qualified to take up devotional service in that level? We are all. We are all qualified. 
At what stage are you qualified? You're just going to let anybody who walks in the door and say, I want to give my life to Krishna? Are you, yes, are they you, have to start. They have to start with the uh, with the regulative principles, and they have to uh, gradually, gradually increase. And that is why this discipline succession is required at that time, initial stages well, to go step yeah, by step. But well, I think one important point which we haven't heard yet is about when Mano accepted Brahma's order. Both were very qualified. Both Brahma was qualified to give the order. And Manu was very qualified as a disciple to accept the instruction. Now, if you take instruction, if you take orders and something from somebody who's not qualified, then that, that can be a, that's a problem. Now, who is actually qualified? They're, they're, qualified, that is why disciplic succession is required. Uh, yeah, uh, but that, that's, that's very vague. It's very vague, you know. I could say, well, you know, I'm dis I'm I'm initiated. Does that mean I'm following the disciplic succession? Is it just a question of formal initiation, which connects us to the disciplic succession? No. Yeah, so uh, the you, other you, person needs to be also has to follow. the The preacher has to also follow these principles and uh, strictly in that uh, regulative principle. There has to, yeah. You have to see these things. There has to see. You have to. One has to understand first what's involved, what he's doing, what he's getting into. Not that prematurely we let people come in and just give up everything, saying and they're saying, "Oh, I'm sick of the world." I, you know, Prabhupada went to Hong Kong. One Indian man came there and said, Prabhupada, I want to take sannyas. So Prabhupada looked at him and said, Oh, why? He said, I have a wife and four kids at home. It's hell. Is that a good reason to let him take sannyas? No. Yeah. Not, not, that's not the proper reason, is it? But the man was saying he wanted to take sannyas. Now Gorgavinda Maharaj came to Prabhupada and he also wanted to take sannyas. Now he also had a wife and several children at home. And Prabhupada gave him sannyas. There's a, because there was a big difference between the two men. So there, there we do have to be a little careful about who we give orders to, you know, giving order, telling people to do things like, you have to surrender to Krishna, yeah, you're wasting your life, Prabhu, material world is useless, it's all temporary, you have to surrender to Krishna. You know, you got, we have to be a little cautious about presenting these principles to everyone, to the public. Social issues are definitely there, the def it's definitely important for us nowadays in ISKCON. We are more conscious, we're more mature, you could say, than in the days of the, there was a something, there was something called the Robin George case. I don't know if you ever heard of it, but it was many years ago. It cost a lot of money and different problems like this where sometimes we can be too fanatical in encouraging people to take the order of Krishna consciousness and you're connected by the disciplic succession. How long are they going to be faithful to the disciplic succession? We do see many people come to Krishna consciousness and they go. We do have that problem people coming, taking initiation even, and then after some time you lose them. If in Russia, I heard Bhakti Vigyan Maharaj, uh, he, he did some survey and he calculated that the average lifespan of a Russian devotee was about eight years. Now that's not a lifetime. So we do have to be cautious Sometimes, you know, you get people come, I want to give everything to Krishna. And then the next month later, no, no I don't want to be a devotee anymore. I want to leave. 
these are issues which we have to think about. So getting people to, uh, to disobey their father <laughs> nowadays, like you know, the way they do it in Chaupati, Radhanath Maharaj's uh, area over there in Chaupati in Mumbai, or Pune, like that, these areas, if they get some nice young men who are serious to be devotees, then they have to, they, they will investigate their family situation. What is the family mood on this? Is the family favorable? Now, if the family is not favorable, what should be done? The family doesn't want their son, their only son, to join Hare Krishna movement. What do you, what, what would you do? You're the temple president and you have to deal with this issue. The boy wants to become a devotee, his family dead against it, he's the only son, he's taking care of his mother and father. What, how are you going to deal with it? First we have to talk with the parents. We have to talk with the parents and see what's their issue and we have to see if we can overcome the issues. Well, the issue is they want their son. Uh, so in, in previous time, we have seen everyone, even uh, when Prabhupada came to West, he also uh, wanted to follow his uh, Guru's instruction and renounced his family. His family was not happy about it, but he had to do it because that's a higher purpose. So in this case, like uh, Kumaras, I mean, the, we have to ignore what parents want, rather think that what is the higher purpose, what is best Well, it's a little difference when you speak about Prabhupada, because Prabhupada was already 50 plus when he left home. He yes, but he regretted, he wanted to come, he, he used to say that I wish I could have come earlier, right? <laughs> what, what do you, yeah, he may say like that, but... Uh, of course, he, he, he didn't encourage people with families, you know, that they, they should just leave, run away from their family and be irresponsible. He makes that very clear. Now, Prabhupada wasn't being irresponsible. He'd already had his family life, the children had grown up, they were there, the older son is there, you know, they're all there, they were, they were all working people and some, you know, so they could take care of his wife. And he left them. He went to Vrindavan. And he was already 50 plus, and he was living in Vrindavan for some years before he went to the West. And when he went to the West, his son, his youngest son did come to see him. But he was already a sannyasi by that time. What about group four? We didn't hear anything from group four. Maharaj, group three is also remaining. Huh? Group three, we didn't speak. It's not clear. What did she say? Group three also has not contributed. Oh, group three. Okay, then let's hear from group three then. At the so in group, uh, we discussed that uh, the most important point from both these uh, uh, principles is that uh, here the disobedient son is also doing the right thing and the obedient son is also doing the right thing. So the uh, challenge which we have is that uh, when Shila Prabhupada says you should be independently thoughtful, that means we should know, uh, we should be educated. That is the challenge that we should be educated, that we should know whom to surrender. Just like uh, uh, even we see the pastime of Bali Maharaj also, he, uh, and he didn't accept his guru's instructions, but he uh, uh, gave the three steps of land to the Lord. So here yeah, we should be, uh, the currently that uh, issue is that we should not be disrespectful to the superiors, 
to whom we are uh, not listening just for uh, just for the higher purpose we don't listen to our superiors but that doesn't mean we should disrespect the superiors okay yes that that makes sense nice that you give a nice example that bali maharaj rejected his guru's order for a higher purpose yes how about relevance in iskon current affairs So, uh, uh, Hare Krishna, uh, I'm from, uh, speaking from the fruit tree. So, we can see that first thing we have to know what is good for us. So, in Manu's in case, the uh, uh, for accepting Brahma's order was uh, good for him. And in uh, Kumara's case, accepting rejecting Lord Brahma's order was good for his. So, we have to see what is our level. So, for that also, we need to uh, uh, we need to consult authority. We need to have some guidance so that we can understand what is actually best for in our Krishna consciousness. Okay. Yes, good. We should be guided by mature, responsible people. We shouldn't make decisions rash, rashly, impulsively. They should be practical and they should be thoughtful. We should be very thoughtful and careful before we make any decisions and get guided by responsible people. Yes, good. All right, group four. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Hare Krishna. Who's the spokesman? Hare Krishna Maharaj, Dandot Pranam Maharaj. Maharaj, uh, from, on behalf of Guru 4, uh, Chaitanya Vishnu Prabhu is the spokesman. But my internet uh, was uh, unstable. So, uh, if Chaitanya Vishnu Prabhu tells something, I will add something. So, Chaitanya Vishnu Prabhu, can you please go ahead? Thank you. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. And Hare Krishna Ramya Prabhu. Uh, so, I'm just speaking... Uh, from uh, my perspective, because I joined ISKCON as a youngster at the age of 15. So I have some kind of experience in uh, Brahmacharya Ashram, Gurukul and Krihasta life. Uh, in, uh, in terms of the uh, orders of uh, uh, Manu being accepted and in terms of Kumaras being rejected, each is a unique and independent situation. And it's based obviously, like Maharaj said, on qualified personnel on both sides on uh, what you call the regulations that are given by scripture and evidence-based uh, historical patterns. So in the time of uh, Brahma, of Manu and the Kumaras, we find that even the society was supportive according to Vedic injunctions and decisions were made with the perspective of understanding the Vedic system to be the law for development, whether someone was even an atheist or not, they would still follow Vedic culture. In current times, we don't have that. And uh, as Maharaj mentioned, uh, ISKCON is a growing society that has been there for 50 years. In the early days, there was certain uh, rash decisions made. And uh, it's very prudent for the young generation and the new devotees or even existing devotees to study ISKCON's history, to find out even the mistakes made on GBC levels. And they're all available in all the resolutions. Uh, we had you know, multiple Guru Pujas, zonal issues, uh, you know, devotees being taken advantage of, uh, you know, different sannyasi issues, grihastha issues, temple president issues, children abuse issues. But ISKCON is learning because ISKCON's philosophy, as far as Bhagavad Gita and Bhagavatam concerned, are perfect. But as a society, we still need a support system that requires government input, security input, financial input, educational input. And ISKCON as a society has not yet reached that scale where it can provide everything in-house and just say, yeah, we're aloof from the world. So as much as we are uh, living in a different dimension of Krishna consciousness, the physicalness is still uh, dealing with so many different societies and we are learning how to deal with them. We are learning how to balance. We're learning how to have mature decision-making based also on historical 
examples. And one example, Maran said of uh, Chopati Temple, they're also very strict. If you want to join the ashram, first you have to come there. You have to be educated. You have to attend Mangal Aarti every day for six months while going to work. And you have to do a seva. You have to be able to open a savings account in which your money will be put. Are you getting medical insurance for your parents? Even you become a brahmachari for the rest of your life. Do you have a savings fund which Ananda Vrindavan Prabhu teaches them? So this is a very, very developed community kind of protocol to sustain brahmacharis so that they also know that financially they'll be taken care of because in the past when Iskon didn't, Iskon was sued. And the, the famous Delhi case where two brahmacharis got over 40 million from the temple because they had given their life and when the new management came, they were removed. So we have such historical patterns and one of those historical patterns which Iskon has implemented is the trustee system. Whenever a new temple is made, it has different trustees who are independent people who can ensure that Iskon's land is not stolen, Iskon's money is not stolen, the property is not stolen if a temple president decides to go rogue. So yes, Iskon is growing and we're learning. Sadhu Shastra is there, but there is also an historical pattern of the application of that. We are still not a society where we are so we're so independent that even if somebody falls down, we'll all gather to support him. We find that 95% of devotees uh, are lonely. They're all suffering from being ignored, not only on this junior level. Prabhupada disciples say that sometimes we hear it, that, you know, we were abandoned, nobody cared for us, you know, nobody understood. So we are not even close to that generation. We've only seen Prabhupada in pictures. So for us, it's even more of a tough challenge to understand what is cooperation, what is that. So relevantly for ISKCON, there is an effort being made. And uh, it's also uh, prudent for the devotees who are part of it to learn these things because it's our choice to be Krishna conscious. We're not being forced. So if we want to make it, we have to put the effort to learn our his history, learn from that history and understand what is, that, uh, what is the future supposed to be like, make those adjustments, make those kind of communities, those kind of forums where things can be discussed. People who are developed, developed Brahminical people, there will also be Varnashram, there will also be non-Varnashram, how to accommodate them. So there's always going to be some new issue. But do we have the forums and people who want to take the responsibilities, understanding that there are different varieties of people. So that's just my perspective, Maharaj. Thank Sorry you very much. I said anything offensive. Yes, thank you. Very nice. Very nice. Uh, would the Prabhu like to add anything there? Yeah, Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Um, Specific to the, our discussion, Manu's acceptance and uh, Kumara's rejection, the principle, general, uh, the importance, uh, as per my understanding, both are required. Both the principles are accepted. Subject to, if they are progressing to elevate in the process of Krishna consciousness. That's a general principle. It's both are required. Then, the decision of the rejection and the acceptance is based on the spiritual maturity and the qualified qualified qualification of the person. So next, how these principles may be relevant in current social issues. So both the principles are required, but current situation in is come if the society doesn't allow to be brahmachari. So. It is better not going against the society because nowadays grosthas are doing like Manu, grosthas are doing uh, very good the service. So focus should be given how to grow, grow the institution more and more. If uh, the, uh, the like acceptance of uh, the family life can help growing the society, so it is also acceptable. But the Main aim is that everybody should have a higher purpose, uh, like the pure devotional service, engage into pure devotional service. Okay. So, thank oh, you. Yes, thank you, Prabhu. Yes, fair enough. Okay, we'll go ahead. Perfect. Would someone like to read this? It's from the purport, text number nine. Someone read, please. If the son, if the son is unreservedly willing to be guided by the father, the father is ten times more eager to instruct and guide him by all means. The father and the son relations, as exhibited here in the dealings of Brahma and Manu, is excellent. Both the father and the son are well qualified. 
and the example should be followed by all humankind. Manu the son unreservedly asks the father Brahma to instruct him, and the father, who was full of Vedic wisdom, was very glad to instruct. For four, three point thirteen point nine. Yes. Note, father and son were both well qualified. Of course, Brahma, the most pious living entity, is Adikavaye, and Manu, also his son, he he, he is uh, qualified. He, he's a very good son because he's approaching the father and asking for instruction, and he's not just some person, you know, like somebody would come to Prabhupada and <laughs> sometimes, you know, you're, you, you may be a very young devotee, and you're not really qualified, but somehow you come to Prabhupada and you say, give me some instruction. So Prabhupada would just say, yeah, you go and serve him. <laughs> go and work with the temple president or something like that. It's not that everybody is qualified to take instructions. Prabhupada could send some people to other parts of the world. One devotee go to Australia, another devotee go to Africa, these kind of things. Prabhupada would do these kind of things. They were not really so qualified, but Prabhupada took that risk because he, he had to do it to begin the movement. But nowadays, of course, we don't do these we don't do these things. It's not so you know, it's not what we it's not how we recommend uh, the preaching to go on. We try to be more careful and more methodical, practical, do things in a nice way. Okay? Perfect surrender and service. Someone read? Oh, hero, oh. your example is quite befitting a son in a relationship with his father. This sort of adoration for the superior is required. One who is beyond the limit of envy and who is sane accepts the order of his father with great delight and executes it, executes it to his full capacity. Translation 3.13.10. So note the points here. One who is beyond the limit of envy and who is sane. <laughs> That's an important point. <laughs> We did get so many, as we, you know, in the beginning of our society, Prabhupada saw so many unusual people came to Krishna consciousness. And Prabhupada even remarked at one point, it's well known, that Prabhupada said, Krishna consciousness is not for lazy people or for crazy people. Because there were a number of crazy people, in other words, not very sane people coming into the Krishna consciousness movement. So the, our movement has developed for the better. Yes, someone read more? The devotees of the Lord, who are all confidential survivors, are sometimes perplexed in the discharge of their respective duties, but they are never discouraged. They have full faith in the law. And he paves the way for the smooth progress of the devotee's duty. Purport 31370. Okay. So that's also more qualifications, taking up the order of the superior, never be discouraged, have full faith in the Lord, like that. One has to be qualified. Okay, we'll go ahead, the next section, dealing with the birth and the deeds of Lord Varaha. Birth of Lord Varaha Dev. O sinless Vidura, all of a sudden, Lord, while Brahma was engaged in thinking, a small form of a boar came out of his nostril. The measurement of the creature was no, not more than the upper portion of a thumb. O descendant of Bharata, while Brahma was observing him, that boar became situated in the sky in a wonderful manifestation as gigantic as a great elephant. So we're hearing about the appearance of Lord Varaha. He was 
personally the Supreme Lord Vishnu and was therefore transcendental. Yet because he had the body of a hog, he searched after the earth by smell. His tusks were fearful and he glanced over the devotee, Brahmanas, engaged in offering prayers. Thus he entered the water. So we're hearing about characteristics of Lord Varaha Dev. Oh, here's a big purport here. We should always remember that although the body of a hog is material, the hog form of the Lord was not materially contaminated. It is not possible for an earthly hog to assume a gigantic form spreading throughout the sky, beginning from the Satya Lok. His body is always transcendental in all circumstances. Therefore, the assumption of the form of a boar is only his pastime. His body is all Vedas, or transcendental. But since he had assumed the form of a boar, he began to search out the earth by smelling, just like a hog. The Lord, the Lord can perfectly play the part of any living entity. The gigantic feature of the boar was certainly very fearful for all non-devotees, but to the pure devotees of the Lord, he was not at all fearful. On the contrary, he was so pleasingly glancing upon his devotees that all of them felt transcendental happiness. Purport of chapter 13, text 28. This very nice description of uh, how the devotee's vision is so different from the non-devotees. You, you must be familiar with the illustration where Lord Varaha is fighting with Hiranyaksha. So when people often see that picture, they think, Oh, who is this terrible creature fighting with this poor man? You know, because... Hiranyaksha has a human form, they think he must be a good person. And they see Lord Varaha, they think, oh, he's some demon or some nasty creature. They don't understand. As Prabhupada said, the non-devotees, they cannot understand Lord Varaha. Lord Bor very easily took the earth on his tusks and got it out of the water. Thus he appeared very splendid. Then, his anger glowing like the Sudarsan wheel, he immediately killed the demon Hranyaksha, and although he tried to fight with the Lord. 13, text 31. So there's some discussion about whether actually the Lord was killed by the, the tusk of Lord Varaha, or whether he died by the hand of Lord Varaha. There's different opinions. So it's explained that uh, first he was killed by the hand of the Lord, and then later on he was picked up by the tusk. Oh, it's, oh this is mentioned here, right? According to Srila Jiva Goswami, the Vedic literatures descri describe the incarnation of Lord Varaha in two different devastations namely Chakshusha and Swayambhuva devastation. This particular appearance of the Bohr incarnation actually took place in the Swayambhuva dev devastation when all planets other than the higher ones, namely Jana, Mahar and Satya, merged in the water of devastation. This particular incarnation of the Bohr was seen by the inhabitants of the planets mentioned above. Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur suggests that the sage Maitreya amalgamated both the Bohr incarnations in different devastations and summarized them in his descriptions to Vidura. From text number 31. Going on to the next section, hearing how the sages glorify Lord Varaha. Text number 36, someone like to read? 
One cannot achieve the result of sacrifice unless one observes the strict regulations. In this age, there is practically no facility for performing sacrifice in strict discipline. Therefore, in this age of Kali, there is a structure regarding such sacrifices. It is explicitly directed that one should perform Sanketan Yajna and nothing more. The incarnation of Supreme Lord is Yajneshwara. And unless one has respect for the incarnation of the Lord, he cannot perfectly perform sacrifice. In other words, taking shelter of the Lord and rendering service unto him is factual performance of all sacrifices. Text Papa 3.30. Okay. Kali Yuga Dharma Hari Nam Sankirtan. Yeah, the real yagna is Sankirtan. Uh, and the Lord is Yagneshwara. So unless one has respect for the incarnation of the Lord, he cannot perform proper sacrifice. We ask people to join in Sankirtan, so they get some benefit by chanting the holy name. But we should actually understand the real purpose of our sacrifice. Sankirtan is it's done with proper knowledge, proper understanding, then the benefit will be much greater. So rendering service unto the Him is the actual performance of all sacrifices. Sometimes the Mayavadis will sarcastically remark to us, what service do you think you can do for God? Oh, okay. Thank you. What they, sometimes they'll say, what service do you think you can do for God? So, what service do we do for God? You know, God is all-powerful. He has everything. He doesn't need us. So can we do any service for Him? Maharaj, we can show our love to God, because Lord has everything. How are you going to show your love for God? You're just going to tell Him you love Him? You're going to say, I love you, I love you? No, Maharaj, whatever, whatever is pleasurable to Lord, like Lord asks, Patram Puspam Phalam So simply we, uh, we can offer by, by love. So we can offer to our Gurudev, Guru Mahar, so to offer that one. This is the way we can reciprocate with the Lord. What Lord told us, uh, preach my glories. So we just uh, speak, that is, uh, if that's pleasurable to the Lord. So this is the way we can reciprocate our loving relation with the Lord. It's in this very simple way. We do not know, but what is mentioned in scripture, we can follow that one. What is so? What is mentioned in the scriptures? Like uh, Lord asks the Patram Puspam Palam Prayam. All right. Yes, he asks Patram Puspam Palam. But uh, as you said, he wants the bhakti, right? He wants the love. So yes, Maharaj. How do how do we show that bhakti? Maharaj, by surrendering unto the Lord. By what? Surrendering unto the Lord. How do you surrender? By serving by performing nine types of devotional service, Shravanam, Kirtanam, Vishnu Svaranam. Yes, by doing things like Shravanam, Kirtan. Yes. And, and also by following the different rules and regulations which are there. You know, when we make, yes, when we make offerings and so on, there's different rules and regulations and things which are required, you know. We want to do everything in the proper manner, like we make an offering, we should be clean, we should be pure. If we're not, you know, if we, if we do things haphazardly, if we do things casually, without, it doesn't indicate much love. There's quality in everything. And so, similarly with Sankirtan, 
the chanting of the holy name. It's a yagya. We want to do it with quality. We want to call the name with feeling from the heart. Yeah? You know that Sachinandan Swami always says to devotees, chant from the heart, from the heart. And so like that, the feeling of the heart is also very important, you know, really reaching out to the Lord and with uh, understanding He's a person and we're offering something to Him. We want to offer our love, our feelings to Him. So we, we want to do it in the proper manner. Okay. Text number 40. Someone read? O lifter of the earth, the earth with its mountains, which you have lifted with your task, is situated as beautifully as a lotus flower with the leaves sustained by an infuriated elephant just coming out of the water. Translation from second party. So, something happened when the Lord picked up the earth, right? What happened to Mother Earth when Bhumi was picked up by the Lord? He got pregnant and Bhamasur was born. Yes, right. And then what happened to Bhamasur? He was killed by the Lord with Satyabhama. Uh, he came with Satyabhama and killed Bhamasur. Yes. Why? Uh, because he captured all the queens, uh, uh, princesses from different kingdoms, made them captive. They sent a letter to Lord and he came to help. Well, you know, Boma, uh, Narak and, uh, what did you say his name? Boma. Boma and... He was a, the child of Bhumi and Lord Varaha. So, wasn't he a devotee? Because of his I bad association with the miracles. Bad association with who? Uh, I think it's Naraka Maharaj. Maharaj. Yes. Maharaj. Bana. Yes, Bana. Yes, Bana. Banasur. Bad association from Bana. He became influenced. He, actually, in his childhood, he was a very good devotee. Mother Earth had raised him to be a very good devotee. He was actually a good devotee. But somehow he got into bad association and became very bad. So much so that the Lord had to come and, and kill him. So this is the, the importance of association. Very important. Yes, someone can read this verse. The fortune of the earth and planet is praised because of its being specifically uh, sustained by the Lord. Its beauty is appreciated and compared to that of a lotus flower situated on the trunk of an elephant. As a lotus flower with leaves is very beautifully situated, so the world with its many beautiful mountains, appear in the tasks of the Lord bore. For Hood 3, 13, 31. Thank you. Yes, beautiful descriptions of the earth being picked up by Lord Varaha. Text 43. Who else but you, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, could deliver the earth from within the water. It is not very wonderful for you, however, because you acted most wonderfully in the creation of the universe. By your energy, you have created this wonderful cosmic manifestation. So, who is offering this verse? Who is offering these prayers? The stages of uh, Mahatloka, Janaloka and Tapaloka or Saptaloka. Yes, they're, are they intelligent people? Yes, Maharaj. Yeah, <laughs> they're very elevated souls, right? They're in the higher regions of the universe. So they're offering these very nice prayers. 
and they're appreciating that the Lord could deliver the earth from the water. And they said, no, it's nothing wonderful for you. They understand the Lord has inconceivable powers, and they give the example. You acted most wonderfully in the creation of the universe. You created this wonderful cosmic manifestation. What to speak of one tiny planet, there's so many planets in the universe, so to pick up one planet from the bottom of the ocean in the universe, not very, but the Lord himself creates many universes. They're all coming out from the pores of the skin. So it's not a very, <laughs> nothing very wonderful to pick up one planet from the bottom of the earth. All right, someone can read the next one. When a scientist covers something impressive to the ignorant mass of people, the common man without inquiry accepts such a discovery as wonderful. But the intelligent man is not struck with wonder by such discoveries. He gives all credit to the person who created the wonderful brain of the scientist. A common man is also struck with wonder by the wonderful action of the material nature and he gives all credit to the cosmic manifestation. The learned Krishna conscious person, however, knows well that behind the cosmic manifestation is the brain of Krishna as confirmed in Bhagavad Gita 9.10. Maya Dakshena Prakriti Suate Sarcharacharam, Purport 3.13.43. Yes, very nice. Thank you. So we should always see everything in relation to Krishna. I heard one morning Srila Prabhupada was on a walk, it was in Hyderabad. So there was a young Western devotee and he was walking with Prabhupada, there were other devotees there. Somehow this young devotee happened to say to Prabhupada, he said, oh Prabhupada, look at the sunrise, isn't it so beautiful? And Prabhupada looked at him and said, if you still want to, if you still want to enjoy the material world, you have to take birth again. <laughs> so, Prabhupada uh, was pointing out to the young man that we have to appreciate not just the beauty of material nature, but the personality behind the material nature. Who created it? Who is the person behind it? That is an important point, right? Uh, Oh. Where were we? This one, yeah. We're Prabhupada, doing the... Can I ask one question in relation to this? Yes, yeah, please do. Yeah. Uh, so, um, shouldn't we then appreciate uh, the wonderful nature which Krishna has created? Oh, yes, we should. But we don't just appreciate the nature, we appreciate who's behind it. Okay, so we have to appreciate both. Well, you can't see the nature without the person behind it. You buy a new car, right? You get a new car. Oh, the car is, oh, is very nice. But who designed it, you know? There's engineers, there's teams of people, you know, they spend time they bringing out the different innovations and things. So, Similarly with the material nature, we, don't, we, we cannot separate the material nature from Lord Krishna. But whose nature is it? It's Lord Krishna's nature, you know, it's under his direction. So we have to, just like uh, Prabhupada was giving a, a lecture to artists and he was explaining to them, who is the supreme artist? And he talked to the artists about, you know, artists will paint pictures of flowers, they'll paint pictures of scenes, mountains and oceans and so on. But who is the creator behind all these things? And Prabhupada explains how Lord Krishna is not just simply an artist who paints a picture, but he actually creates these objects all of these things are his creation and they're actually all his energy 
which he arranged and combined in such a manner, and it, it just bewilders people. And some people spend their whole lives just studying the material nature. Prabhupada talked about how some scientists, they study grass, and they study how the grass grows, and you cut it and it grows again, and they were studying all the different uh, chemical structures which are there in the blade of grass, and how the grass grows, and you know, they spend their whole life like that, and they never understand who is actually behind this, who created the grass, where does it come from? So people get very caught up in the material energy, chemists and physicists and so on, they don't understand who is actually behind this whole creation. So that's an important point. We want to understand that. Thank you, Maharaj. Maharaj, uh, can I say something? Yes. Maharaj, in this connection that about grass, the proper says that uh, uh, when uh, the cow eats grass, it gives milk. <laughs> but if we eat grass, then we will die. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We wouldn't be very happy to eat grass, right? So Krishna arranged, he, he arranged the grass for the cows, and the cows give milk for us, that we're supposed to drink the milk. Okay, next text, 44. Ordinarily, the body of a hog is considered impure, but one should not consider that the hog incarnation assumed by the Lord is also impure. That form of the Lord is the personified Vedas and is transcendental. The inhabitants of the Jana, Tapas, and Satya Lokas are the most pious persons in the material world. But because those planets are situated in the material world, there are so many material impurities there also. Therefore, when the drops of water from the tips of the Lord's shoulder hairs were sprinkled upon the bodies of the inhabitants of the higher planets, they felt purified. Jai. Sometimes, you know, we get experiences, you know, you get people come to the temple and, you know, when they offer water to the deities and then they come around and they will sprinkle drops of water on people's heads. You know, some, some people are eager to get the water, you know, those people who are devotees, they're eager to have the water on their head. But those people who are not devotees and who don't know this, you know, they, they shun away, <laughs> they don't want the water on their head. Sometimes you get, you get groups of people like that coming to the temple, they're maybe coming for the first time and they watch the RT. And if somebody comes around with water, sprinkling water in their head, they go, oh, <laughs> you know, they really don't like it. But here, although it's a boar, the large shoulder hair, the, these inhabitants of the higher planets, are, they're very intelligent people, they feel purified. Because they know it's not just the boar, it's the personality of Godhead. Okay, takes 45. Yes, someone? Oh Lord, there is, a, there is a no limit to your wonderful activities. Anyone who desires to know the limit of your activities is certainly answers. Everyone in this world is conditioned by the powerful experiences. Please bestow your causeless mercy upon this conditioned souls. So the unlimited nature of the Lord, we often say inconceivable, His wonderful activities. It's very important for people to understand this uh, appearance of Lord Varaha, which is being given to us in the third canto. If people have difficulty to understand the Lord as Varaha, then it's going to be much more difficult for them when they come to the tenth canto. Because in the tenth canto, the Lord appears in the human form and He performs activities which are 
Incon totally inconceivable. You know, picking up the Govardhan Hill and dancing Rasalila and all of these things. So, without first of all understanding the pro these incarnations like Lord Varaha, it will be very difficult for them to understand Lord Krishna. That's why Lord Varaha is coming here in the third canto and Lord Krishna comes in the tenth canto because there's a lot of purification to be done before they actually hear the tenth canto to actually understand Krishna Leela. That's going to be more challenging for them. But just to understand the Lord as Varaha is a challenge. So it's certainly inconceivable how a boar could pick up the planet from the bottom of the universe. These things are difficult for people. But they have to understand the Lord is inconceivable. He has inconceivable energies. And that's the important point. We, we cannot limit him. There's n no restrictions on him. He can appear in any form and he can do anything. Okay. Text number 45. Mental speculators who want to understand the limit of the unlimited are certainly nonsensical. So the Lord is described there as unlimited, the limit of the unlimited. How can there be a limit to the unlimited? No. Every one of them is captivated by the external potencies of the Lord. Every one of them, the mental speculators, they are captivated by the material energy, which is just Krishna's external potency. The best thing for them is to surrender unto him, knowing him to be inconceivable. For thus they can receive his causeless mercy. This is a, to get people to understand that there are such things which are inconceivable is also very difficult for them. People are very materialistic and they want, they think everything should be, they should, you should be able to measure it, it should be, you should be able to calculate everything and it should be all understood, it should be very empirical. So this prayer was offered by the inhabitants of the higher planetary systems, namely Janatapa and Satyaloka, who are far more intelligent and powerful than humans. What do we know? Right? <laughs> the one devotee was, Prabhupada was giving class in Australia and he was talking about you know, birds which fly from one planet to another and huge eggs and you know, he was, he, Prabhupada was talking about Timingala fish which can, which can swallow a whale and the devotee stood up and said, Prabhupada, it all sounds very inconceivable, doesn't it? I mean, just, you know, this big bird which flies from one planet to another, and a fish which swallows a whale. And Prabhupada simply looked at him and said, what do you know? You're, all, you're still in the womb of your mother. <laughs> that, that, that was Prabhupada's refute of the devotee. The devotee argument. You're still in the womb of your mother, what do you know? So this is, you know, this is the problem. The mental speculators, they try to see everything in their own limited vision. They cannot understand. But for people in the higher planets, it's very clear to them. Okay, the final section, Varaha returns to his own abode and Maitreya offers benedictions. If one hears and describes in a devotional service attitude this auspicious narration of Lord Bohr, 
which is worthy of description. The Lord, who is within the heart of everyone, is very pleased. Very nice to hear the Lord's pastimes. And Lord Varaha is one of the Das avatars glorified by Jayadev Goswami in his Gita Govinda. Text 48. Intelligent persons should therefore hear personally and cause others to hear the descriptive narrations of the Lord's activities, for that will destroy the pangs of material existence. Out of his causeless mercy only, the Lord comes to this earth and leaves behind his merciful activities so that the devotees may derive transcendental benefit. Uh, the Lord Varaha is one of the avatars, right? Avatars, he descends, he's coming to this earth. He leaves his activities behind. We have other forms of the Lord. For example, we have Lord Krishna, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, and we say Vrindavan Dham. The Dham means a place where Lord Krishna resides eternally. And in Mayapur, Lord Chaitanya resides eternally. It's a Dham. The Lord is residing there eternally. Lord Varaha, he's an avatar. He comes and he goes. But he leaves the pastime, his activities, and the devotees get transcendental benefit. If one serves faithfully, there is no possibility of frustration, because the Lord himself takes charge of the devotee's advancement. The Lord is seated in everyone's heart, and he knows the devotee's motive and arranges everything achievable. In other words, the pseudo-devotee who is anxious to achieve material gains cannot attain the highest perfectional stage because the Lord is in knowledge of his motive. One merely has to become sincere in his purpose and then the Lord is there to help in every way. Pur -pur Text 49. So the different moods are there. Krishna is in everyone's heart. He knows everybody's motive and he arranges accordingly. So Prabhupada talks about pseudo devotee, anxious to get material gains. They're not going to get the perfection. We simply have to be, therefore, sincere. So the sincerity of purpose and the Lord is there to help. Only an animal or a man who is almost an animal in behavior can refuse to take an interest in hearing the transcendental message of the Lord. There are many books of stories and histories in the world but except for the histories or narrations on the topics of the personality of Godhead, none are capable of diminishing the burden of material pangs. Therefore, one who is serious about eliminating material existence must chant and hear of the transcendental activities of the personality of Godhead. Otherwise, one must be compared to the non-humans. Text number 50. Okay, so we'll stop there tonight. Are there any questions? Any comments? Yes, Maharaj. I wanted to ask two questions, Maharaj. Yes, Prabhu, go ahead. Uh, does uh, Mara, does Vara avatar comes in, in the age of every Manu? Well, he's a Lila avatar. 
it's is it in every manu we're I I we've got the Chakshusha manu and the Swayambhuva manu of it. We didn't hear about the other manus. We're now in the the seventh manu, right? I think we're in the seventh manu, isn't it? In this day of Brahma, one one day of Brahma, how many manus? Fourteen. Right, and we're, I think we're we're maybe maybe it's eight manu now. But we only have information about two manus. Maharaj, uh, we are in the uh, seventh one. Oh. That is 20, 20th Dwapar and there, there after this Kali. We are in seventh one, that is Vaivasvata Manu. Yeah, Vaivasvata Manu, yes. So it's the seventh one. I, I know, because I always thought, you know, we, they say usually we're in the middle of the day of Brahma, a little over the midday of Brahma, half a, the half a day is over. So I thought maybe we were into the eighth Manu, but yeah. You're, you're right, the seventh manu. By this yes, there are 71 jugas of each manu. Right. So we have only, and he has uh, spent only 28 uh, jugas. The rest of uh, jugas are there for the, this Bhagavad manu, seventh manu. Mm -hmm. So we only have information that I see from uh, these two man, these two avatars. I don't know about other avatars of Varaha. We should understand uh, Maybe if the earth falls into the bottom of the ocean, then, then you may get another Varaha avatar, you know. There has to be a particular need for that appearance of Lord Varaha. But it was described, it was described, it's mentioned in the Navadvita Mahatmya, I mentioned at the beginning of the class how Lord Varaha did appear in Navadvita and he appeared in the Satya Yuga. So that was... And that, that was due to the prayers offered by a brahmana. The prayers offered by a brahmana in the island of Koladweep, uh, he brought about the appearance of Lord Varaha in the Satya Yuga. So that was, you know, that's in this manu, in, the, in this yuga, in this Divya Yuga, that uh, Lord Varaha appeared there in Koladweep. So certainly, the Lord can come. Just yes. Yes, Maharaj. May not, may, Maharaj. Not, may not be any lila, may not be picking up the universe or killing a demon, but he can come, yeah. Yes, Prabhu? Yes, Maharaj. Maharaj, from the commentary of the Acharya, as we read, as read from the purport, so this Shvetvaraha came to rescue the earth from the waters of devastation. So it means that uh, maybe after in the end of the day of the Brahma, after 1000 Chatur Yuga, there is partial, partial annihilation, and at that time, um, Bara, uh, this Vara Avatar came. So how can it be in the middle of the class? I just now said. No, but, but we said the earth fell into the bottom of the universe. It wasn't that there was a devastation. But the, the earth fell into the bottom of the universe because of the work of, maybe it was Haranyaksha, because of his drilling the earth, that he upset the equilibrium of the earth, and so the earth fell into the bottom of the Garbhadak Ocean. But not that the, the whole universe, that there wasn't a mention of a devastation. But at the end of every manu, there's a partial devastation. So at the end of every manu, there's a partial death. So it could have been at the end of the, the reign of the uh, Swayambhuva manu that the earth fell into the bottom, because at that time there is a partial devastation. Yes, 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 Maharaj. And the killing of Hiranyaksha is the for the red varaha in some other manu, Chakshusha manu. Yes. And. So? And that time, earth didn't, didn't fall in the ocean. So these are two separate right. incidents, as you told. Right. That's right, yes. Okay, thank you, Maharaj. Okay. Any other co questions, comments? Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Maharaj, I didn't get... Uh, can, can I ask the question to prepare more clarification? Please. Yes. Uh, Maharaj, uh, uh, like... Partial devastation, during partial devastation, so like, like every uh, mono, so earth is going down. So Lord Baraha comes to pick up or uh, 
how it is maharaj could you please clarify at the end at the end of every manu there's a partial devastation so it's described that the, the lower planets that means the upper four planets which mean mahaloka janaloka tapaloka satyaloka these four planets you know they're at the top of the universe so they remain but there's a the lower planets the, there's a devastation which takes place at the end of each manu partial devastation so the devastation may be the flood maybe a flood that uh, maybe the the planets all um, or maybe sometimes it's a fire there's a fire and the because it's described in brihad bhagavatamrita how there's a fire and and the, the different demigods, they go up to the higher planets, they will leave Swarga Loka and go up to the Mahar Loka and Jana Loka, Tapa Loka, Satya Loka, just to get away from the, the fire of devastation which, go, which is going on in the lower regions of the universe. Does that answer your question? Maharaj, this is clear, but uh, like uh, Aju said, Maharaj, these four planet, top top planets, they remain, but other lower planets, uh, they are affected by this devastation. So that means Earth is always affected oh, during yeah. the partial devastation. Yes, Earth is also affected. So, yeah. So that means that means at every every end of the manu, so Bharathdev comes to rescue the Earth. No, the no, not necessarily. Not, not necessarily that Varaha has to come to rescue the earth. Just like at the end of every day of Brahma, there's also an annihilation. So what happens at the end of the day of Brahma is also a partial annihilation. And then, the, then again, you know, begins again. Creation comes about again. How it happens... How does the creation come up? Well, you've been studying creation. You've been studying creation in the second canto, in the third canto. You just finished creation there. You heard Sukadeva Goswami describe creation. How does it come about? How do the planets all come about again at the end of the devastation? At the end? By the power of the Lord, by His inconceivable powers. The planets all come back. The creation comes about again. How does it come about in the beginning? The Lord enters into the universe. So in the bottom of the universe, you have Garbhodaka Shai Vishnu there. And you have the lotus flower. And you have Lord Brahma. And the, so diff Maharaj, can, the different Maharaj, planets. Can, can we conclude? Yeah? Maharaj, can we conclude that uh, this uh, as per description of Srimad Bhagavatam, like Swayambhuva Manu and uh, Chakisha Manu, uh, in these two Manus, uh, the Varahadeva appeared. Only these two Manu. Is that correct, Maharaj? Yeah, that's how I understand it, because that's all we're told about in our scriptures. So I don't know about others. We have to accept the information which is given to us. No one's commented about any other appearance of Varaha. Oh, I, I mentioned to you about how Varaha appeared briefly to a Brahmana in Koladweep, Navadweep, in the Satya Yuga. It's mentioned by Bhaktivinoda Thakur in his Navadweep Dham Mahatmya. But I don't know about any others. Thank you, Maharaj. And we don't, we don't know about any other leelas which Lord Varaha performs. When Jayadev Goswami composes, it, when he wrote his Dasa Avatar Stotra, he described Lord Varaha as picking up the earth from the bottom of the universe. Okay, Maharaj. Thank you. Clear, Maharaj. Mm -hmm. uh, Maharaj, one quick question. 
Uh, does uh, Varadev have his own planet, like... Uh, oh, yeah. Have? Oh, yes, must have, yes. Yeah, the Lord Varaha will definitely have his own planet there in the, in the Vaikuntha, where his devotees will be there with him. He will have his Vishnu form, forearm Vishnu form. Maharaj, does Hiranyasha come in each Satyuga? Does Haranyaksha come in each Satyuga? Yes, actually that's mentioned that uh, Haranyaksha and Haranyakashipu, that they come regularly, but not that every time they're Jayan Vijay. One time they were Jayan Vijay. But every time you get these demons, you get, the, you get some demons taking birth. It's, you know, you get some Haranyaksha and Haranyakashipu. Yes, so only two times Hiranyaksha was killed by Lord Varaha. Other times, no, some other Leela. On, only one time he was killed. No, we only know oh, okay. one time killed by Lord Varaha. Not two times. One yes, time. yes, Maharaj. One time. Yes, Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, I wanted to clarify one line in the purport for verse number eight. May okay. I read it? Yes. Uh, okay. This line of disciplic succession from Brahma is spiritual, whereas the genealogical succession from Manu is material. But both are on the progressive march towards the same goal of Krishna consciousness. So, Maharaj, I wanted to ask that how the genealogical succession from Manu, which is material, uh, its goal, how can its, its goal be Krishna conscious? Its goal is just for Nashama Dharma or some material uh, uh, conception. No, no, Manu is a great devotee. Manu is a, you know, is a very great devotee of the Lord. He's in power. Swambu Narada Shambu. Swambu Narada Shambu Komar Kapalo Manu. He's one of the Mahajans, right? Yes, Lord. The Mahajans are all authorities in devotional service. Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, any other questions, Prabhus? Okay, so we'll, we'll finish here tonight. And uh, I'm sorry, tomorrow I have to... Uh, I have to take up some other engagement, but we'll meet next weekend. Is that all right? Understood? Everybody know? Yes. Clear, Maharaj. Okay, so we'll meet you next weekend and we'll have two chapters. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Jai. Jai.